Are you on the panel? Also? No, not really. I'm going to make a little brief comment, but I'm not on the panel. Okay. But you drink water, so you know. water. Here I am. Hey.
What are you doing with that study? What's your official study group? Study group. He's with the National Study Group. The League of Women Voters operates at three levels, national, state, and local. And uh, as I said earlier, we don't take positions on anything unless we've studied them and come to consensus. National has the, all the leagues in the United States um, doing a study of privatization and government right now. And Ted is working with that group. And I've seen, I think, at least three of your papers on the website. So he comes with some special information, and we knew that that question was rattling around about privatization, so Ted very graciously agreed to come up. So we thank all of you panel members very much, and um, I'm going to ask Representative McGrady, since he is with the study committee, if he'll be our first speaker. Thank you uh, for the uh, introduction. I might note for those of you who are standing, uh, there are seats and they look like the comfortable seats um, actually up top. So uh, if you just want to find a comfortable seat, go on up to the top, you may have a better view. Um, as, appreciate the introduction. Um, I am a, a freshman member of the uh, General Assembly representing most of Henderson County, which is uh, uh, just uh, south of Buncombe. Um, I included in my district is the city of Hendersonville. Um, as, as indicated, I serve on this committee. Um, it's a five-member committee. Um, there are, there's a representative, uh, Mr. Representative Murray from Wake County, uh, Representative Brisson from uh, uh, County East of, uh, of uh, in the eastern part of the state, uh, Senator, uh, Representative Brawley, who is from Mecklenburg County, um, Representative Moffat uh, from Buncombe chairs it, and I'm another member. I suspect that the other members of the committee were um, recruited to be on the committee. I actually volunteered uh, because of the issues uh, related to regional water and sewer. Um, I felt like it was really important that my county um, uh, be, at, be at the table on this. Um, as indicated, uh, there is a hearing coming up, and uh, that will be next, uh, next Thursday. Henderson County's perspective on water and sewer um, is fairly straightforward. Um, Hendersonville does not really want to be part of any water and sewer agreement of any sort. Um, they have got uh, a system that actually connects to the water uh, system um, in two places, I believe. Um, but um, it, it, the, the issue of connecting in some way to Hendersonville, other, other than for drought reasons, uh, really is not an issue at all. Um, Henderson County, on the other hand, is connected both on the water and sewer side of the issues. I know most of the focus is on the water side, so let me just quickly on the, on the sewer side. Um, Henderson County has a sewer system, and it does not have its own sewer plant. Um, all of the sewage moving from the, just the north end of Henderson County uh, moves along um, the river um, to the um, plant that is operated in um, Buncombe County. And there have been discussions in the past and, and they were very amicable and got fairly, fairly close to uh, um, reaching an agreement about potentially um, merging uh, Henderson County system with the um, Metropolitan Sewer um, District. Sorry. On, the, on the water side, um, uh, Back in the uh, mid-90s, um, the city of Asheville, at that point needing more water, came to Henderson County and asked for um, an agreement um, to allow uh, the city to build a water plant in Henderson County. That water plant, there was an agreement signed, the uh, water plant was built, and, and some portion of, of the city's water now comes from a plant that is located out, actually now Mills River, um, in Henderson County. From Henderson County's perspective, and I'm not being in, trying to be in any way argumentative or pejorative, but uh, uh, Henderson County's perspective, the, the agreement um, uh, was not uh, honored. Um, the, the, there are many components to it, but basically the city of Asheville agreed to provide water um, primarily to industrial sites in the northern end of the county um, to um, uh, uh, had uh, gave uh, Henderson County a, a seat on a regional water authority, and three, provided Henderson County with a piece of land up in Bend Creek area, 
which it was anticipated would be sort of down payment for Henderson County to ultimately join the Metropolitan Sewer District. As you know, um, the regional water authority was terminated. Um, we do get water from the city of Asheville, but only after we sued to get the water. Um, and uh, um, we're not part of the Metropolitan Sewer District. Uh, the land that was in question um, it wasn't needed by MSD and really is inappropriate. So from, from Henderson County's perspective on the water uh, issue, um, and not to, again to be too legal here, but it, it seems like there was a failure of consideration. And there are very hard feelings um, between Henderson County particularly and the city of Asheville. Um, and no great uh, desire to, to be part of uh, a system unless there can be better, um, uh, very clear that, that we won't get ourselves back into the same situation. I'll end by just noting, um, there is a notice for this coming meeting that's going to occur. And uh, I'll just read it real quickly because it's important. The committee will, hear, will be hearing comments about regional water and sewer issues involving increasing efficiencies in the delivery of services, realization of economies of scale through better planning, engineering, and administration, as well as the important role water and sewer has in economic development for our area. We, are also, we will also accept comments regarding the public water system managed by the city of Asheville along the three publicly stated potential study outcomes. One, the water system remains managed by the city of Asheville. Two, the creation of an independent regional authority similar to MSD. Or three, merging the water system and MSD, creating a regional authority. Um, the reason I wanted to just highlight that is, is there's been a lot of discussion as I read it in, in the newspaper about uh, a privatization issue. I can state for everybody here um, I have had no conversation with any of my colleagues about privatization. I have heard no comments or suggestions that privatization was on the table. And the, the statement that uh, the committee chair put out uh, defining the, the committee hearing that will occur uh, in about 10 days, likewise, um, does not include that as one of the options. I, I, to my knowledge, I, no one is interested in a, a privatization issue as part of this committee process. And you're going to read uh, Representative Moffitt's... Yeah, I'll read that right now. Okay. In fact, I'm sorry, I meant to read it before I introduced you, Chuck, so... Uh, we did... Uh, uh, Representative Moffitt was not able to be here tonight, but he did send a statement, and I will read that. This is the public statement for the League of Women Voters Water Forum 2012. I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for again demonstrating their willingness to participate in a robust public debate regarding the public water system managed by the City of Asheville. The rich 92 history of the League, its commitment to educating the public on complex issues as well as its nonpartisan stance on those issues, allows for constructive public discourse and increased community awareness. The work of this League, the last public debate on the subject, is considered widely to be the most well thought out and thorough review of this matter. As most will recall, it occurred as a result of the cancellation of the Regional Water Agreement 15 years prior to its maturity by the City of Asheville. The regional upheaval and distrust that has created remains to this day and has created much acrimony within our community. As a result, the League study at that time recommended the formation of a truly independent Regional Water Authority. The careful attention to detail on how to form the authority and its operation is exceptional and will be considered by the Legislative Committee during our review of the system's management history. Of particular interest is the League's work in the manner to which accountability was created by the election of certain authority members. The approach suggested was not only unique, it was very practical and eminently fair to all classes, all classes of water users. In closing, <clears throat> excuse me, there are only three potential outcomes based on this study, as um, Representative McGrady just read. The city will continue management of the public water system, the creation of an independent <coughs> regional water authority, or combining the system with MSD, which is already successfully functioning as an independent regional authority. The debate should focus on these outcomes. However, I would be remiss if I did not address the issue of privatization 
There is an element in the city suggesting privatization of the public water system is under consideration. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a lifelong resident of this area and city taxpayer, I would never agree to privatize this public access. Consequently, I do not object to and will pursue the creation of legislation ensuring it will remain in public control in perpetuity, thus ending any concern regarding that unfounded accusation. Kind regards this evening, Tim Moffat. If I, if I could, um, one last thing. Um, we, this is, we had one meeting in um, Raleigh, um, which the Vice Mayor of Pro will probably talk to. Um, there, we've got this upcoming meeting in, uh, at the Ag Center. Um, there will be either two, one or two additional meetings, probably in Raleigh, um, to hear from uh, Henderson County for sure, um, among others. Um, normally a bill that um, is not capable of coming to the floor of either house, unless it is passed the other house um, in, the sh in the long session, we just finished the long session, next year, is the, this year now, is the short session. Um, the select committee, though, is capable of, of uh, drafting a bill and having it moved to the House of Representatives. As a select committee, it, it can do that. This is a select committee, though, just of the House. It's not a joint committee. So um, if a bill were to come out of this committee, presumably um, in April at some point in time, it would, could come to the floor in May, could be taken up by the, the House, but it then would have to move over to the Senate. Um, and you know what the prospects are for moving a bill all the way through the process um, is, is really would be only be speculation. And I'll, I'll leave with that. I will note I'm a former president of Sierra Club and I'm also uh, a mem former member of the North Carolina Clean Water Management Trust Fund, so I've done a lot of water-related stuff over the years. And thank you very much. Thank you. Vice Mayor Esther Mannheim. Um, thank you very much. First, I want to thank all of you for coming out. I'm uh, overwhelmed and amazed by the turnout. This is fantastic, and I, it's kind of one of my dreams that people really get interested in this topic and turnout. So this is this is terrific. And and thanks to you, Nelda, and everyone else for hosting this forum to highlight such an important issue. Um, I do want to um, say that I I'm up here um, as a council representative, city council representative, um, and um, I think there's some things the council has reached consensus about, but sometimes I'll speak my opinion, uh, and I'm obviously, obviously other members of council may have a different opinion. I do want to recognize that Mayor Bellamy is here, and um, council member Jan Davis is here, um, council member Mark Hunt is here, council member Chris Pelley is here, um, county commissioner chairman David Gant is here, county commissioner Holly Jones is here, um, Senator Martin Nesbitt is here, and uh, Susan Fisher, Representative Susan Fisher couldn't be here, but her husband is here. And we've got a couple of um, county commissioner candidates here, Michelle Pacewood and Brownie Newman. And of course our Register of Deeds is here, and my dad's here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I want to recognize there's, there's a lot of folks in this room, former Mayor Lenny Sitnik and former Mayor Russ Martin, thank you for coming, that have a lot of history with this, this issue. There are a lot of others that do, and it's been a big catch-up job for me to read everything I can and learn all about uh, as much as I can to make sure I'm as well educated as possible on the history. But what I want to focus on with you all is how good it is today. Today we have a water system that is run by the city of Asheville that is, it is transparent, it is efficient, it is well run, it is run as a separate enterprise fund for all you uh, bean counters out there, and it is not used to subsidize the city's general fund, um, it, with one exception, this, the, the uh, legislature does allow us a small transfer to uh, support water related projects. Uh, we're digging the place up to put in water lines to use for road resurfacing or sidewalks in the area or greenways in the area or whatever the case may be. But that's fairly small. Uh, I mean, basically we're running a water system not really for any financial benefit to the city. We're running the water system because it's important to have a good steward of such a vital part of our community. 
We have a huge amount of land. We have water reservoirs. We have assets that need to be protected and well run. Um, and so, you know, what is it? What is? What are we in it for? You know, that's basically it. It's it's not like it's some uh, cash cow for the city of Asheville. Um, I, I, to that end, I provided you all with a handout that I'm not going to go through, but does include some information that I presented to the study committee in Raleigh, um, just about our system. How big is it? What are our rates like? What's our tax rate like? How competitive is it? Um, just so that you have some nuts and bolts information. And if any of you didn't get that handout, uh, we've got more copies. Um, we, we, the city, were invited by Representative Moffitt to participate in the hearing in Raleigh that took place on January 3rd, and we um, exercised that option and did go and participate. We're thankful for that. I also sit on the board for the Metropolitan Sewage District, and, um, and Steve Cedar will talk to you more about that, but they also participated in that process and presented at that committee. Let me tell you a couple of things about how the city is working with MSD um, in, in working with the study committee. We created a task force between MSD and the city of Asheville, and Jan Davis and I are appointed to it from the city, and there's two members on it from MSD and our collective staffs. We've been working together to try to organize ourselves so that we can work constructively with this Legislative Research Commission chaired by Representative Moffat, upon which uh, Representative McGrady sits, so that we can interact with them constructively, we can react when needed, if there's requests for information, you know, so that we can lobby, basically, that we can we can be out there. Um, I know people hate that word, but it's really not that bad. It just, it just means we're actively participating and we're hopeful we can influence the outcome. The other thing I want to tell you is that tomorrow night, on the City Council's agenda, we will be considering a resolution uh, for the City Council members to adopt taking an official position on the issue. And I'll tell you, in short, the resolution is basically one page, says that we don't want to change to the current structure. We're not interested in merging the system with MSD or transferring the system to an independent authority. We would just like to continue to operate the system. Um, now, you all have a job in this too. I'm so glad you're here tonight. You're going to learn more. and. It'll be complicated, but you're, um, you're going to learn it, and then you're going to go talk to all your friends. And it, because it's important to have an opinion about this issue, to talk amongst yourself, have somebody over to dinner, chat. It's really not that boring of a topic, and public utilities is fascinating. And <laughs> I'm serious. It is. I used to staff a public utilities committee. I thought it was great. But you need to have an opinion, and then you need to make your opinion known. You need, to, you need to let your legislators know how you feel about the issue. Uh, and and that's, that's a vital element. And the worst thing that could happen in this whole situation is that we didn't participate in the decision-making process. That would be the worst thing. So we really need to do that, and it looks like you're well on your way, and I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Jean Rainey, we'll, we'll go back into history now. Well, I go back into that history with a disclaimer. That history ended for me 15 years ago. When you get in your 70s, there are problems with memory. <laughs> but as was pointed out, we have two mayors here, ex-mayors, and we serve with them, and they will remember much more than, than I do. Secondly, I have a, a hope Last time as a retired minister that I was in this building, I performed a wedding ceremony. And it's lasted to this day, and I hope that uh, this meeting has the same outcome in some way. <laughs> <laughs> Let me briefly describe the city-county water agreement that was in effect when I was chairman from 1988 to 1996. Uh, the Water Authority was established I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, both sides appointed members, thank you. To compensate the city for its loss of revenue during that time, we took over management of four facilities. McCormick Field, Ashton Park Tennis Courts, 
the golf course and the recreation park. The county also paid compensation to the city for the uh, police department's uh, patrol and investigation because the sheriff of Bunker County did not come into the city limits to enforce the law since the police department was doing a good job of that. All four of these facilities were in bad shape. We upgraded the uh, golf course, the recreation park, the tennis facility, and we built a new stadium for $3 million. Uh, at one point, the, the uh, city decided that they wanted to withdraw from that agreement. It was costing us something like $2 million a year to follow it through. And that agreement then was, was disestablished. There are four questions that are raised by the legislature's proposal. I'm going to give these quickly to you. If you wish a copy of this, give me your email address and I'll be glad to, to send them to you. First question. Should the new water authority be under the control of a political agency or a business company? And I think the representative that's answered that, uh, Representative Moffitt's comments reported in the Asheville Citizen Times confirms the fact that a business uh, arrangement is not in the works. Uh, but I would hope that the decisions that would be made by a regional authority would be made on business calculations and not political concerns. Second question, would the city of Asheville be compensated for selling the system to the new water authority? I hope, I hope with a real, real loud yes that they would be compensated. There's an unknown factor which has been spelled out by the vice mayor about uh, what, how much money might be involved in that. We would hope that the sale would produce an income to the city of Asheville because that organization, that water uh, machinery that they have now is very expensive. It would have to be appraised and Asheville would have to be rewarded for all the good work that it's done. Third, assuming that the new water authority is a political organization, how would the governing board be chosen? The answer to that question, I think, is in the answer to the fourth question. Should the Water Authority be a regional organization? Again, I hope the answer is a resounding yes. We should invite other water systems in Buncombe County. Uh, again, my memory escapes me, but I remember Weaverville, Black Mountain, and Woodland all have their own water systems. Result, uh, Henderson County, I would hope would forgive Asheville of its sins and would uh, be willing to, to come back into it. It needs to be truly, truly regional. Madison County, Haywood County, too. So I would hope the regional, the Water Authority would be a regional system for several reasons. First, most of the small water systems that I just named, uh, Whitman and Black Mountain, Weaverville, for instance, are based on wells. There's a limit to the number of wells that you can drill. On the other hand, the French Broad River flows through many of these counties. It represents a great source of liquid gold, liquid gold for the other counties as well as for us. Second, the Appalachian chain is one of the three poorest regions in the United States. The other two poor regions that we rank with, the Mississippi Delta and the Native American reservations. Water is liquid gold, and a regional system would help economic growth, new homes, new businesses, jobs. We are a poor area. 20% of the people in this area right now are hungry. One in five people. Buncombe County is not quite 20%, it's 18%. We cannot expect the federal government or the state government, 
especially in these times, to solve our problems and to solve them ourselves. And I think we can. And last, we in Buncombe County and Asheville will greatly benefit from a regional system. Buncombe County is the seventh largest county in North Carolina. It has one third of the population of Western North Carolina. Asheville is the center of this region in two important areas, financial and medical. If this region prospers, we prosper. In conclusion, I know that Representative Moffitt's proposal has not been overly popular in Asheville, all right? I'm a Democrat, and among my people, Tim's efforts have been roundly cursed. But we owe him a debt, a debt for bringing up an issue that needs to be addressed now. I believe that we can find a solution that will pay Asheville for its progressive policy of water development over the past decades. In particular, we need to recognize the forward-looking policies of the former Asheville City Manager, Weldon Weir. But we need to build on these progressive policies for the future in a way that rewards Asheville for its constructing a wonderful contribution to regional economic development, a large and efficient water system. I appeal to the actual leaders to help us find a way to transfer this system to a regional water authority that will give the city a financial payoff and will fund its future budgets. Asheville deserves this reward and recognition. But more importantly, this region is badly in need of the liquid gold. The water represents that can bring us economic development. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Steve Asico, who is chairman of MSB and has his own authority practice here. Thank you, Nella. Can you all hear me just fine there? No. 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 Okay, how's that? <laughs> I'm good. I'll just eat this thing. Okay. We, uh, you know, listening to those lovely bells, I made me think of Hemingway. Oh, <laughs> oh my. So, uh, I've been the chairman of the MSD board for the past six years, and I've been on the board off and on since 1985. And, uh, uh, you think it's about time that I got a life and serving on the sewer board, but at least the sewers are in good hands. Um, but I'm really here sort of as the History Channel until I saw Dr. Rainey. So uh, I think he's really the History Channel. I think I'll have to step back to like discovery or any of the year or something like that. Uh, but the MSD board, the MSD is an independent agency. It's not a part of the city or the county. It's a creature of statute, and uh, it's a regional public utility. It's established by law. Its management is determined by uh, the seven member municipalities who send representatives to the board, there's 12 board members, and Esther is one. And I represent the teeming metropolis of Montreal. And, uh, the uh, member municipalities appoint the board, but the board members themselves are accountable to uh, the sewer rate payers. So it's run as an enterprise, and all of its revenues go into the sewer system and are used to maintain it and improve it. And it has a capital improvements program with a 20-year time horizon. In deciding where things go, we are informed by engineering considerations. We have a system of of analyzing and determining uh, a scoring of the conditions of our of our pipes, and uh, determining uh, th in that way what's going to be replaced next. And uh, we did not uh, MSD did not offer any policy about extending the sewer until the county gave us a land use plan because MSD did not want to become a uh, uh, 
Take the winners and losers and, and what would happen to land use development in our, in our county, in our region. So we follow the lead of the county in that and uh, uh, the determination of where sewers might go in the, in the future is determined by the zoning and the, and the, the goals of the municipalities about where they think that density should occur. So MSD is independent, but we consider ourselves politically accountable and exercise restraint uh, in <coughs> dealing up with public issues. And one of those, for, for that very reason, I think the board has taken no position at all, pro or con, on any of the issues raised by this legislation. So we don't have, the board is not generating an opinion whether the water system should be removed from the city of actual control. Uh, and uh, any decision about where, what, where MSD might end up in all this is really in the hands of the legislature. But we haven't offered a preference. So I suppose at this point, that sitting up here for MSD, I'm really sort of a potted plant. <laughs> Hopefully a attractive potted plant. It's the same. Um, but uh, just to give you some context here, uh, I did speak to the legislature. Uh, I'm not on the committee that was formed uh, to, on behalf of the MSD in the city to respond to the legislature. But uh, of course, MSD's function on that committee really was simply to assist in providing information and data, and not there to uh, negotiate a position or, or uh, anything of that sort. But, uh, Jack McGrady asked me a question in the meeting. He said, why is MSD here? And he asked me, uh, would the people who envisioned MSD feel like it has done its job? And uh, the answer to, to answer that question, you really have to go way back. You have to go back to the financial cataclysm that enveloped the city in 1930. Um, our city was, our region was growing at 20% per year through the 1920s. We were almost as big as Charlotte, the second largest city in North Carolina, and closing in on Atlanta, and would have been there, uh, but not for the fact that uh, the banks that were our major financial support of industry here failed in 1930. One bank in particular. Uh, at that time, the city and county had accumulated the highest per capita debt in the United States and uh, had recently raised a significant amount of cash, put in the bank. The books showed that the city in 1930 had $5 million in the bank. When the bank was audited, there was $18,000 left to run the city for the next year. And some of you who have a little history here will know what happened next. That the, all the fine buildings that had been opened up had to be closed. The, Policemen and firemen and teachers went without pay. The animals that were in the very fine zoo down where the rec park is now starved to death. It was a uh, it was a truly terrifying time. But all this debt was uh, had been accumulated, and Thomas Wolfe had something to say about it. I think is quite memorable. He said, "Asheville has squandered fabulous sums. They flung away the earnings of a lifetime. They mortgaged those of a generation to come." They had ruined their city. In doing so, they ruined themselves, their children, and their children's children. And now you know why he couldn't go home again. <laughs> <laughs> but some seeds were planted there that are with us today. And that's why I, I go back so many years. Because what happened next was that with all this debt and confusion, where it wasn't even known just really who the money was owed to. It was just a terrible mess. And people had money in the bank, but they couldn't use it to pay their debts. So uh, the legislature responded with the Sullivan Act. The Sullivan Act, you've already heard about, but it really wasn't about water at all. Not primarily. It was really about finances and about dealing with the consequences of losing all of the money. All the city council were indicted. All of the officers of the bank, all of the county commissioners. The mayor committed suicide three days after the indictment. In a very, very public default, it was well known throughout the country. So that 
put us in a terrible situation for the future. And the decision was made, and the city was a part of this, and the county was a part of this, and all of the entities that were formed to build things to provide infrastructure for the venom came together and, and, had a, and made a debt restructuring agreement. And the Sullivan Act allowed the water revenues to be used to fund the repayment of the defaulted bonds. So that's where most of the money came from rather than from the taxpayers. And that allowed the tax rate to be kept low to keep from depressing matters further. But in various points, only 30% of the money that was coming from the water system was actually used to run the water system. It went to pay back those bonds. But they were paid back, every penny. And so the city, is, our community established two things that are with us today. One is a cooperative, collaborative approach to problems, to infrastructure issues, to financial issues. It also established a commitment to fiscal integrity and to good government so that what happened in 1930 would never happen again. And that's part of our legacy. And I see you sitting here in this room, and uh, you, you really vouch me for that by being here, that water and sewer matter to you, and they should. And, but this is part of your community's DNA, to be here and to participate in this discussion. So why is MSD here? Well, uh, all the money went, that would have gone to water and sewer maintenance and infrastructure and extension and repair went to pay back those bonds. So there was nothing left to, uh, to, to fix things with. And uh, this got, was a terrible problem by the 1960s. And Wilma Dykeman wrote about it. The French Broad River was dead. No one, you couldn't go near it. It was, it was toxic. So MSD was formed because there was no other source of financing to do the bonds because Buncombe County and Nashville bonds were a joke. I mean, no one paid back in Buncombe County bonds. Ha, ha, ha. So a new entity had to be created that was truly independent and could demonstrate that it, had, that it was fiscally independent, even though the community had already made it clear, the city, the county, that they were committed to financial and fiscal integrity. There was a ways to come in the future. So that's how MST got started. It was a legislative creature, and it was able to issue the bonds and build interceptor lines to get the sewage out of the river and build a treatment plant. But it didn't own the collector system. And this set up another problem. And that problem was that the various municipalities still were sending the sewage down to the planet, but there was, they had no control over it. And when it rained, 100 million gallons would come down, and there was no way to treat it. And the EPA was breathing down everybody's neck, and Gene will remember this. And so once again, the community came together and did what its DNA told it to do. And the leadership of Larry McDevitt, who was the mayor of the city of Asheville, and forged a, con a consensus by a committee that the MSD would take over the collector system that it did not control and would then take the fiscal responsibility for replacing the system that had been built in the 20s and had been neglected while the bonds were being paid off. And that is what happened. In 1990, MSD took over uh, this system in Buckingham County, which includes a little chunk of Henderson that served. And uh, that's, the past 20 years have been very good for the system. It is, uh, it's an award-winning system. The problems are being addressed. Uh, much of those lines that created such a, a pollution issue are fixed. The French Broad River is now up to recreational classification. And that's nothing short of miraculous. We went from dead to now you can swim in. So, uh, and that's what the community did. This was a result of the community's commitment to a collaborative group uh, solution that involved uh, creating and supporting MSD, first as an entity to provide a treatment plan, and then to take care of the larger situation. So that's what brings us really to where we are today. Now, the matter of consolidating water and sewer has come up once or, time, twi uh, once or twice in the past. More often, this matter of consolidate of uh, regional water has been coming up many, many times over the years. But uh, let's see, MSC has never taken a position on it. And uh, I think that you know, what has 
as the board chair of MSD, what I would simply leave you with is this thought that uh, you have a, a marvelous tradition of, uh, of collaboration in problem solving and in infrastructure issues. And uh, you also have a marvelous opportunity right now to have a community discussion about what's good for the whole community for the future. MSD is, is accountable to its winners, and we will do our best to, to advocate a position. That's a different point of view. Thank you, Nelda, and good evening. And uh, if you have to hear the representative McGrady says that my presence here is moot. Well, that, that's okay, because Asheville is a beautiful town, and I love coming up here. <laughs> Plus, I had the pleasure of meeting a new friend, Neil DeHoler. So, uh, if my being up here is new, well, that's just fine with me. I'm just playing up here. <laughs> uh, as Neil mentioned, uh, I'm an uh, environmental consultant, and I just want to mention the focus of my uh, years as an environmental consultant has been associated with the remediation of contaminated soil and groundwater as well as the uh, treatment of, of uh, contaminated groundwater. Uh, Nelda, of course, invited me to sit on the panel this evening, not because of my background in environmental consultant, but because of my experience as a proud member uh, of the League of Women Voters. And I want to mention that uh, Nelda forgot to mention that I'm a member of the Greenville County League of Women Voters. And of course, as you can tell, not all members of the League of Women Voters are women. Uh, I had the pleasure of myself and seven other uh, members of the League of Women Voters to uh, co-author a national study on the topic of privatization. Uh, privatization is uh, something that's uh, really taken off primarily since uh, President uh, Reagan uh, issued an executive order uh, to, to study how privatization might make uh, government more efficient and, uh, and uh, you know, that, that was a, a primary initiative of his that has since taken off. And uh, that the study that we uh, uh, authored, uh, the goal of it was not to become an advocate on behalf of private, for privatization or against privatization, but it was to uh, educate the electorate on the uh, privatization process as well as the potential benefits and pitfalls of privatization. Privatization is viewed by many as a panacea to address real and perceived government inefficiencies. Proponents of privatization quite frequently cite free markets, competition, efficiencies, lower costs, and lower taxes uh, is just some of the reasons why uh, we should try to privatize as much of the government as possible. On the other side of the spectrum are those who abhor the thought of privatizing government. They quite often fear that the public interest will take a backseat to profits. While conducting research on this topic, I saw many more examples of privatization failures than privatization successes. But let's be objective. The Evening News commits much more every time to automobile accidents than it does to be drivers. Regardless, privatization of government uh, is very complex and uh, much more complex than what the advocates uh, would, lead, uh, would lead you to believe. I just want to share some general concepts that, uh, uh, that came out of the study that we did. Privatization typically works best when the services to be privatized are limited in scope and in complexity. Privatization typically works best when the services to be privatized are in growing and competitive markets. Uh, 
privatization works best when information associated with the services to be privatized is abundant and the private uh, sector provider is held accountable to the public. Privatization works best when profitability, profitability can be achieved in ways that are not contrary to the public interest. Privatization works best when the majority of stakeholders um, are open and receptive to the idea of privatization. Privatization works best when the privatization process is transparent to the public. Privatization works best when the affected government has prepared comprehensive privatization policies that are developed before privatization is initiated. Uh, one of the things I did uh, as part of the study is I looked at uh, state laws. Now, I realize we're talking about municipal and county here, but uh, uh, most states, and I'm sure it's the same for most cities and county, county governments, do not have any laws that really address privatization, how it should be conducted. Uh, some states do, like Massachusetts, but they have some pretty extensive uh, laws that dictate how the privatization process uh, must work. But unfortunately, many states, and again, county and municipal governments, aren't prepared to privatize. And it's important that if ever uh, there's an initiative to privatize any form of city, county government that uh, regardless of what what the uh, whether it's uh, water treatment or some other form of government it's important that this, uh, stakeholders understand that uh, you need to get out in front of that and develop criteria and processes that will make sure that, that uh, all the boxes are checked and that, that privatization doesn't uh, go awry. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. We really appreciate the breadth of your experiences and what you can offer here tonight. Um, I've got some other people to thank before we get to the questions. I uh, want to thank our co sponsors, the Mountain Express and the Urban News helped us in planning this forum and in giving publicity. Um, I'd like to recognize Margaret Williams, who's the managing editor of Mountain Express. And I'd like to recognize Jeff Phobes, who is the publisher and is hiding in the back. And I would actually like to recognize Jeff Phobes' mother, Hazel. I know she's in here. Um, <laughs> Hazel would know everything. <laughs> and uh, also, we did Johnny get here? Okay. Uh, I want to thank Johnny Grant, uh, who's the publisher of the Urban News, but she was unable to come. And her editor, Andy Reed, is here taking notes and running business for us. Um, so thank you all. And a special thank you for a couple of league members who are sitting, well, one league member and one guest. I think we've made you join yet. Um, Devin Dial and a volunteer, John Blackwell, have set up our sound system tonight, but they also are live streaming for us, and we just so appreciate that. We feel so forward all of a sudden. <laughs> so thank you so much for what you've done to get this set up. And um, we're going to have questions. Before we do, there are a couple of people that I'm going to introduce, and, and I've given them permission to make a statement instead of ask a question. It is because of their personal expertise, and I really appreciate that they came up to say that, number one, they were here, and number two, they would like to make a comment. We happen to have um, Jan Davis, who is also a liaison to a city council member, Councilman John Davis, and he's also one of the liaison to the study committee. 
and um, we'll have him speak first. And we have um, former Mayor Russ Martin, who would like to make a brief statement. And we have somebody real special. We have Matt, Mike Holcomb here, who happened to run the Water Resources Department uh, and worked there for 23 years, so he knows a little bit. And he's also on the MSD board. Um, so uh, we're going to have those two people make their brief statements, and then we will open for questions. We'll just, you know, come up, make a line, or just come up one at a time, or, there, or two at a time, so we can save time. There will be two minutes allowed to questions. If you can, don't use all two minutes, but um, because we want to get as many questions as possible. Okay. Thank you, Melba. I'm going to turn it back to you. I apologize for that, but I'd rather look at the, uh, the audience. Um, I heard the bells and, and thought of Hemingway as well. My overarching concern is for whom does the bells toll? I think it may be uh, the National Water System. Um, I had the, the pleasure of going down uh, with uh, accompanying uh, Esther, and Mark kind of also went with us that day to Raleigh, and um, I wanted to. Uh, to say a couple of words, and it's great to have Holly and Brown in the room because I think, uh, and the mayor, we were there when we dissolved the, uh, the agreement to begin with. And, and I was afraid when we got to Raleigh that it would play out as it did. It was a matter of going back to 2005 and arguing or not arguing, but being shown what happened and who actually owned the water. At the end of that, uh, that meeting, uh, I, I did, and I wanted to dispel this. Uh, this myth, uh, uh, Senator Moffitt, or uh, Representative Moffitt, uh, neither cut me off or did not recognize me. I was sitting there gathering my thoughts, and he ended up meeting. It was not his fault. I want that to be known. That the, that's been going around. That's really not what happened. But I think that, importantly, with uh, Brownlee, Holly, the mayor, and myself, when we did that in 2005, we did that for the betterment of the system. It had gone several years without its uh, capital improvement plan being ratified. Mike, you'll remember those days, and, and we've not been spending money on the system. The county was recipient of 2.5% of the revenue stream, and the city got 5%. And at that point, we felt like if we're, we had a, a Brown Caldwell had done a study telling us how much we had to spend to refurbish the system. I think it was $67 million at that time. Immediately once we dissolved the agreement, we set to work and, and extended debt a year and a half later for $40 million, and we paid about $12 million in pay-as-you-go money to fix the system. It was so good, in fact, that Senator Nesbitt, to his credit, led a charge that gave us 5% of that revenue stream that Esther alluded to a moment ago to do repairs when we dug up the world and we'd go back and fix streets and sidewalks and those things at that time. So it was, that was a gift and it was, it was well spent and we've been good stewards of that system since 2005. I think that we really should, as a community, focus not on the boogers and the bushes or anything like that, but on running a really good system. And Asheville has been treated uniquely over the years and we're not arguing that at this point. We lost in court, we lost an appeal. So we're not arguing that point. What we want to do is continue to run that system well, not be treated differently than other cities, and continue to be good stewards of, of what we're doing. I, that's just a, it's kind of a, the same thing. I wanted to say down there at the state committee was that the ratepayers have paid for that system over the years, but that's not unique to any other municipal system. And most municipalities, including Wilmington and Weaverville, 